Hello, hello, my students. Today we are going to talk about RNA and transcription in prokaryotes. The central dogma for gene expression is the big overall idea that every living thing must go through to actually express their genes, to get a protein. So, the central dogma is going to be DNA to RNA to protein through two different things. DNA to RNA is through transcription. You're actually transcribing it, making it into a new language, just like scribes would. Then you're translating it. You're reading the language and producing something. So, in translation, you're going to actually read it and translate it into something, a protein. So this is the central dogma. Why do we do the central dogma? First, for environmental change, we must be able to turn on and off genes. We can't have every single protein being made all at the same time. So we can turn them off and on. Then the proteins that are created can then deal with the new environmental change. RNA. RNA is different than DNA. It's ribonucleic acid instead of deoxyribonucleic acid. So RNA contains the ribose sugar instead of the deoxyribose sugar. The bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. There's no thymine, there's uracil in RNA. Uracil pairs up with adenine. They have very, very small chemical differences in the DNA, but there's huge structural differences. You all know the structure of DNA. The structure of DNA is, did you say double helix? Good job, double helix. Now, for RNA, it is single strand, one single strand. Now, this single strand can do multiple things. It has the ability to fold into 3D shapes, and it can actually be functional, such as an enzyme, and do things. Take a look at some of the structures. RNA. So, we can first have a stem loop, where we have a section of the RNA that is complementary. So, if they're complementary, so if they have an A and a U, it's going to come and stick together. So, here we might have an A and a U, and a G and a C, and a G and a C, and a C and a G, and a U and an A. And since they're complementary, they're going to come and stick together. Well, that leaves this loop up at the top. So this is called a stem loop structure. A hairpin loop actually looks like a pin that you put in your hair, sort of like a bobby pin. And how that is formed is also whoops, through complementary bases. These bases here are complementary. Therefore, they will be able to stick together, and it forms a hairpin loop instead of a huge stem loop. The other structures are going to be called tertiary structures. And that's where it can fold on top of each other and make a 3D knot, or what they call a pseudo knot. So RNA is more like protein. It has structural domains that can connect and are more flexible and can lead to different functions and different shapes. Types of RNA. We have four. You should remember three of them from your biology class. Messenger RNA, known as mRNA actually holds the message, the gene that encodes the protein. Now the ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, forms the core of the ribosome. Remember, there's two subunits to the ribosome, the large and small subunits, and those are made from ribosomal RNA. The third type is going to be the transfer RNA, or the tRNA. That transfers amino acids found out in the cytoplasm and brings them to the mRNA during translation. We'll get that more of that in our next video. There's also small regulatory RNAs that we call non-coding RNAs. They're there, but they don't really code for anything. Transcription, transcriptional control. Transcription has three parts. Initiation, elongation, and termination. The start, the middle, and the end. That's what we're going to talk about in this video. Next video, we'll hit processing and translation.
Prokaryotics transcription is going to take place over not just one gene, but a group of genes. This group of genes is called an operon. Operons are groups of related genes that are transcribed by the same promoter. So there's going to be one promoter at the beginning, and then it's going to transcribe all of these genes into one message. This is called a polycysternic RNA. Poly meaning many. So, it has many genes in this one single mRNA. When it's transcribed, multiple genes are transcribed into one transcript and then can be translated into individual proteins. So since there is no nucleus, transcription and translation can occur almost at the same time. So as the mRNA is being made, the ribosome can be right there going ahead and forming it into a protein. So what happens is during translation, the, pro the RNA, our RNA, the ribosomal RNA, will come and translate this section into the E protein. The second section, just kidding, get back to the second second, section section into the D protein. The third section into the C protein, fourth into B, and fifth into the A protein. So out of one mRNA, one message, we can get five different proteins. So transcription. The biggest thing is controlling it, whether we turn it on or off. And that's going to happen at the initiation of it. The control of the initiation is the most important because we don't want them to be going all the time. The initiation players. Who's, hap who's in the initiation? We have RNA polymerase. You've heard of polymerase before. Remember, he's the guy that lays down stuff. You've heard it as DNA polymerase that lays down DNA. Well, this is new. This is called RNA polymerase. And can you guess what he lays down? Good job. He lays down RNA. Now, RNA polymerase has four subunits. Two alphas, a beta, and a beta prime that make up the RNA polymerase. Right here. Transcription factors also come into play, specifically the sigma factor. There are many types of sigma factors. The promoter region on the DNA is another thing that happens that is in the initiation. The RNA polymerase must bind to this promoter before it can actually go and transcribe the gene. An operator can sit on the promoter repressing the transcription, which means not allowing it to occur. Once the operator is removed, then transcription can take place. That's one way we can control initiation. A second way we can control it is with enhancers. So a promoter is sort of like a red flag. I stick a red flag, I say we need it here. Red flag, hold it up, red flag. An enhancer does exactly what it sounds like. It enhances or increases the affinity or the binding strength of the sigma factor to the protein. So what an enhancer does is it not only has a red flag sitting there, but it has a neon sign that says right here, right here, right here, right here. So that that sigma factor and the RNA polymerase will be more likely to come and bind there. More about RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase, like I said, has four core subunits, two alphas, a beta, and a beta prime. And it's also got that sigma factor. The sigma factor determines which promoter it's going to land on and which gene it's going to actually transcribe. The core and the sigma must combine to create a holoenzyme. The holoenzyme will then go and bind to that promoter sequence and catalyze or start the opening of that D DNA to create a bubble complex and start transcription of DNA to RNA. Sigma factors. Sigma factors are important. They are the transcription factor. They um, many sigma factors bind to many different promoters. So, 
Once the sigma, sigma factor might bind to this promoter, and a different sigma factor might bind to this promoter, and they might encode two different genes. So different sigma factors bind to RNA polymerase and recognize a specific promoter. Most bacteria have major and alternative sigma factors. For example, E. coli has seven sigma factors, and B. subtilis has 18 sigma factors. If you think about that, which one has more control over which gene? The sigma factor, the 18 sigma factors in the B. subtilis, because they have more sigma factors that can specify which promoter to go on. Generally, bacteria that live in a more varied environment must have more sigma factors because they must compensate for what's going on in their environment. This is a chart that gives you some ideas of what sigma factors are and how many genes they code for. Sigma factor 70 is going to be for growth and housekeeping. And that's a lot of things. That's most of its life. So it actually controls about a thousand genes. Sigma factor 54 only occurs during a stress response. So it's only about 15 genes or so. You can look through the rest. Heat shock is a fun one, extreme heat shock, and unfolding of proteins. But the idea is that with the sigma factors, you can control which genes you are going to encode for. So let's take and look at the steps. We have the sigma factor and we have our RNA polymerase come together to create the whole low enzyme. That holo enzyme sits on the promoter and it recognizes a negative 10 region and a negative 35 region. These numbers indicate how many nucleotides before the start of the gene. So, 10 nucleotides before the start, it will recognize this sequence. 35 nucleotides before the start, it will recognize this sequence. The holo enzyme sits down onto the promoter region. And it has a closed complex, which means the double strands are still closed. It initiates an open complex, which you all know is the bubble. Once we have the open complex, or the bubble, the promoter releases. The sigma factor releases, and the, mRNA, or sorry, the RNA polymerase is allowed to continue through with the bubble, adding new complementary RNAs creating a messenger RNA. So here we show that the, the bubble has moved, our DNA, our RNA polymerase has added new RNAs creating our mRNA, our messenger RNA. Termination, there's two types. There's row independent and row dependent. Row is a protein, and we'll see one that doesn't use it, and we'll see one that does. Row independent termination. The termination sequence in the mRNA has two features. First, it has a series of U's that indicate termination. Second is a GC-rich self-complementing region that binds together to form a stem loop. See all these C's and G's that come together and form a stem loop? Well, this stem loop causes the RNA polymerase to pause. It goes, the RNA polymerase goes, what is that? I'm not a exactly sure what that, um, what is that? And as it's sitting there on the U, pause, the U's are unstable and the RNA polymerase actually just falls off. And that terminates the elongation. Row dependent termination uses a protein. It's called row protein. The row binds to the mRNA and it moves along the mRNA until, until it reaches the RNA polymerase. Termination seems to depend on the ability of the row to catch up to it. So once the row moves up the R mRNA and hits our RNA polymerase, it bumps it off, ending, uh, ending elongation.